lead to progress. So if your desire is that your marriage would be one that progresses forward, you need to embrace the uncomfortable, for it's out of the uncomfortable that progress is birthed. If in the workplace you want to progress to the next level, we need to embrace the uncomfortable. As a church, for us to progress to the next level, we need to be willing to embrace the uncomfortable. But have you ever arrived at a shop again? And as you arrived at the shop, you come across a notice that says, back in 10 minutes, sorry for the inconvenience and thank you for waiting. It's like, I don't want to wait, but you're thanking me for it. This is really inconvenient. This is an uncomfortable moment. You're, you're disturbing my schedule and my plan. I plan to be here on time and suddenly you're changing my schedule around. Or we're sorry for the delay. Man, none of us enjoys a delay. Who enjoys a delay in their schedule? When you've worked everything out, hour by hour, minute by minute, and suddenly there's a delay, something has to now shift, something now has to change, and as human beings, we don't really enjoy change. And the uncomfortable is the catalyst to bring about change in our lives. So change is not made without inconvenience, and even from worse to better. If you're in a worse situation than you've ever been and you say, God, I want you to improve my situation. I want to go from worse to better. I want, I want something to change for the better. Well, better can only be birthed through the inconvenience. It's many times it's the uncomfortable that brings about the best change that we need in our lives. Remember two Sundays ago, I said to you, and I asked you this challenging question. How, are you, how far are you willing to go to follow Jesus? You know, we're living in a... An atmosphere today. It's very difficult to really authentically be that Christian that we need to be. For many times, we want to do our own thing. Many times, revenge looks like the better option. Many times, quitting seems to be the better option. And to be a man and a woman of faith today in a climate where people are walking around with a high level of negativity, speaking negativity around every corner, then we need to stand and believe God for something better, how far will we go? So again, I'm dealing with overcoming the inconvenient. We did part one a couple of weekends ago, and tonight we're just gonna end it with a part two. This is not gonna be a long series, it's a very short series, but tonight we're gonna deal with part two, overcoming the inconvenient. How many of you had an inconvenient time recently? Last week you had an inconvenient moment, or even back to yesterday, I know of, of a family in the church yesterday who was involved in a car accident. Not planned, didn't ask for it. No one got the WhatsApp and, and said, you know what, I'm, I'm just come along the way, I'm going to bump into you. I'm going to smash into you. I mean, they were, no, no one asked for that. It's inconvenient. Zengisa walked up, woke up today. Who, who would have ever thought that today she would be losing her sister? That this afternoon her sister would pass away. It's a, it's a disturbance and it's an inconvenience because you didn't plan for it. But how do we overcome it? So again, if we look at the word inconvenience, the word inconvenience means it's the state or fact of being troublesome or difficult without, with regard to one's personal requirements or comfort. I don't know about you, but I have my personal requirements. Do you have your personal requirements? Let, let, let's not see comfort as evil because we all like a place of comfort. It's all nice to go home and have a hot plate of food and a hot shower and a comfortable bed. And, and, and we all seek for some form of comfort. And comfort isn't evil and comfort isn't bad. But if we're looking for a life of just comfort, then we're asking for something that's not possible. Not in this world. In this world, we're going to have enough trouble every day. Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, Jesus says these words, and he says in verse 34, each day has enough trouble of its own. I don't want to be a bearer of, of gloom and doom, but the reality is tomorrow, trouble awaits us. We have got to find the way to have the tenacity, the courage, the strength, and the wisdom to face the troubles of this world because it's not going to get easy and it's not going to be easy. It's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be inconvenient. Have any of you ever come across trouble that's pleasant? Has trouble ever been your friend? 
Have you ever thrown a party around trouble and invited the neighborhood and say, come and celebrate my trouble? But the Bible says tomorrow, Jesus said tomorrow, we'll have enough trouble. So, you know what? We, we must somehow learn not to be a troublemaker, but to become a trouble overcomer. How do we work through our trouble? Because there's no alternative route around it. No GPS is going to get you around it. The reality is we've got to learn how to get through it and how to overcome it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Can I say this with respect to you this evening? And I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to myself because we're all going through trouble. Alright? But the trouble in this world can be a great catalyst for us after this world into an eternal realm. We've got to learn to, to deal with the trouble in this world because it has eternal bearing on our lives. But let's be honest, when we go through trouble, it doesn't feel light and it doesn't feel momentary. It feels like this trouble is here forever. It feels like it's here to stay. And it feels like a heavy load. But when we understand that it is just a moment, there is a way to overcome it. There is a way to get through it. And that's what we've got to speak about tonight, is how do we get through it? James chapter 1 and verse 2 to 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Man, every day, life is full of troubles, but everyone is of a different shape and form. They come unexpectedly into our lives. And the Bible says that we need to consider it, which means our viewpoint and our perspective about it needs to change. We need to see something good in the pain that we know that we know that we know God's going to birth something good out of it. I think sometimes we give way too much credit to the devil. We give the devil way too much attention and not see our father in the midst of it saying, don't worry. You'll get through it. It's momentary and it's light, but it's going to work it out for your good. And I'm in it with you and I'm going to see it through with you. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God's heart for us is to be mature. God's heart for us is to lack nothing. He wants us to have everything we need. He wants us to feel a sense of completeness. But all of that does not come through an easy route. I haven't found that road yet. But it comes through the route of having to persevere. Persevere means no matter what the objection is and no matter what the opposition is, I'm going to see it through. I'm going to see it through. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to give up. Because I could be on the verge of God breaking through in my life and I give up. We've got to learn how to persevere. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. This is a conversation that God had with Adam and Eve after they sinned. After they ate from their forbidden fruit, and if you remember how they blamed each other, how Adam blamed Eve. You remember that? And then Eve blamed the serpent. Everyone kind of was blaming each other. And no one was taking responsibility for doing the wrong thing. And then God comes into the midst and he says, here are your consequences. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. Just in case someone told you life will be easy. Let me tell you they lied. Life is never easy. To be easy. And in this corrupt, fallen, sinful world, life will never be easy. So if anyone tells you serve Jesus and your life will become easy, it's a lie. Serve Jesus and it becomes a bed of roses. I have found more thorns than petals. How about you? Rather, let's prepare people for the narrow journey. Let's prepare people for the real world. That in this world you're going to have heartache. And in this world you're going to have trouble. But even Jesus himself said, but, but be of good cheer, I've overcome this world. There is a way through it with me in your life. I don't know how, he, how can someone today live without Jesus? Think about it. Where would you be today if it wasn't for Jesus in your heart? Some of us would be behind prison bars. Come on. 
Some of us have gone cuckoo by now. Insane! We would have gone crazy! Hey? <laughs> if it wasn't for Jesus in our lives. But in Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. To the woman God said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. So in childbearing it ain't going to be easy. With painful labor you will give birth to, ch to children. And your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And my God, that's even painful too. <laughs> so the, the promise over this lady's life is from here on out. Here on out, you're going to experience pain in your life. But now Adam, just before you think you're free from the pain, let me tell you this. Verse 17 of Genesis chapter 3. To Adam he said, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. A common word. Painful toil. You're going to give birth to children out of pain. You're going to have to experience pain in your life. And, 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 and gentlemen, you're going to have to work hard. I don't know about you gentlemen, but money doesn't come easy. I haven't found that tree yet that I can just pick it off. Still looking for it. It's been hard labor. And let me tell you, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't carry the curse of the ground on the cross. He carried the curse of your sin on the cross. So even as a Christian, you're still going to have to work the cursed ground today. And trust him for a blessing. You are still going to work with sweat and tears. And it's still going to be painful. And you're still going to have a boss who finds you intimidating. And a boss who's trying to work you out of a company. And you're going to say, but I'm a child of the king. I should not encounter this in my workplace. We forget the ground still is cursed. But I'm not cursed. I'm living under his blessing of grace. He took the curse of sin and nailed it to the cross. And I am free from it. But the ground I walk on is still cursed. And I'm still going to trust God to pour out His blessing on my every step. It doesn't come easy. Some of us have to fight for our wages at the end of the month. Come on now. It's not easy. When I'm a Christian, you should just give it to me. Do you know who my father is? That doesn't work in this world. In this world, pain is part of the journey. Verse 18, God goes on to Adam and he says, It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. How many of you men are still going to be tired at night after a hard work, hard day's work? And you call yourself a Christian. Well, that's part of the journey. For some reason we think that as we walk, the thorns disappear, the mosquitoes disappear, the flies disappear because the light has arrived. Mosquitoes are still biting me. I'm still walking into situations that are unpleasant. And I have to work. And it's painful. And it's tiring. And it's frustrating. But as long as we're in this world, it's going to happen. I wish I knew this when I first became a Christian. I got so confused from day one. I still thought I had a devil in me. Because things weren't changing. It was getting worse. <laughs> but let me tell you. I found Jesus in the midst of my pain like I never found Jesus before. I found his peace. You'll never know his peace unless you go through pain. You'll, know, you'll never know what his joy is unless you go through pain. You will never know His grace and His mercy and His kindness unless you go through pain. Pain is the doorway for me to encounter His grace. That when I encounter His grace, I'm so thankful because I understand what it looks like because I know what pain looks like. Pain is a catalyst. It works to my own good and it works in God's kingdom for His glory. So don't see it as the work of the devil. Every time something goes wrong. Man, we give the devil way too much credit. Look at the old devil. Look what he's doing to me again. Why? Then we go into the closet and have spiritual warfare for a whole hour. Shouting at every demon, every devil in hell. And by the way, no one's in hell yet. Publicly and theologically. We're going to get that right. Demons are floating around right now doing as much as they can before they are thrown into hell. We've got to speak to Jesus more. 
We're going to love Jesus more. In the midst of your pain, go to your closet and talk to your father in heaven and say, Father, I don't understand this. I don't know what's happening, but I need your peace. Before I kill someone, I need your wisdom. Before I hurt someone, I need your joy, Lord. God, I need you. I don't need the devil. I need Jesus. This is not a time to shout at every devil. This is the time to speak to your Jesus and to worship your God and to love your God with all your heart and all your mind and let Him come through for you and let Him be glorified in your life. Someone needs to say amen to that because that was good preaching. I'm not saying that arrogantly, but that was the truth. That should be truth that every Christian said, Preach it, Pastor! Yes! That's how we used to react right in the beginning when we came to know Jesus. What has happened to our faith? We get desensitized. We become numb. That just becomes Christian language. That we don't hold on to the promises of God anymore. Come on now, church. We get to revive a sleeping giant. A sleeping giant called the body of Christ. This is not our time to sleep. It is our greatest hour. This is our time to shine. When the world is crumbling, Christians walk in with their faith. We've got hope that has never moved. We walk into darkness and we shine. Someone recently said, and it's true, there's a blanket of darkness over East London. Man, there's a laziness, there is a neglect, there's a level of witchcraft over East London next to none. When you walk in, people feel oppressed. Walk our streets, you know why they're so dirty? It's because of witchcraft. Witchcraft robs you of dignity and self-worth. That's why there is neglect in the city. So what must we do as a church? Well, I think I'm just going to move to another city. Can I just tell you something? We're called the light of the world. Light is supposed to shine in darkness. We don't get intimidated by darkness. We walk into our streets and for goodness sake we shine our light. Someone needs to say amen to that. We don't run us away. We don't quit us. We don't give up. and We don't fear the devils. We don't fear the darkness. We are the light of this world. So sleeping giant, it's time to rise up. Sleeping giant, the bride of Christ, the church of the living God. It is your time to stand up and to shout from every mountain top the God you believe in and to declare the truth and let the truth make a way where there seems to be no way. It's your time for the miraculous. It's your time for the supernatural. But unless you stand, you're not going to encounter it. As long as we sleep in it, we're going to miss it. It's time to shine. Turn to someone and say, yeah, I think he's talking to you. But it's hard, Pastor. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. We know it's hard. We don't know by tomorrow how our bills are going to get paid. Just like you. We fear what you fear. There's nothing extra special about us as a pastoral couple. We're just as human as you. And bleed just like you bleed. And shout and scream just like you shout and scream. But I choose to believe in the God that saved me. I choose to believe in the God who can still keep me. I choose to believe I know who I am in Him. Come on, church. It's going to get uncomfortable. What's going to happen in our nation next year is going to make you uncomfortable. I'm not a predictor of doom and gloom. But man, there's a bit of writing in the wall. But if you're sleeping, you ain't going to see it. Without Jesus, you're not going to be able to sustain what's coming our way. Church, it's time to get close to Jesus like never before. Because there's coming a shifting in our nation next year. And for those Christians that are sleeping, you're going to miss it. Come on. Amen. And don't get another ticket to get go to cross to some other nation. Oh my word, praise Jesus, he's with us. You don't know what's happening on the other side, and it's not greener. It's not greener. There is no heaven on earth till Jesus comes and makes all things new. I think I'm going to go to New Zealand. It's like heaven on earth. No, no, you, 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 there's trouble on every corner. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Oh my word, Lord, please change my perspective. Because sometimes my hardship seems to be an attack of the devil. In the meantime, the hardship is my father disciplining me. Not punishing me. 
but disciplining me. Not punishing me, but equipping me and training me so that I can become everything that as a child of God I can become. So I've got to endure the hardship, not as a work of the devil against me, not as a guilt trip of what have I done wrong, but as if my father is saying, it's okay, it's going to be sore, it's going to be painful, it's going to be inconvenient, it's going to be uncomfortable, but I am going to train you, equip you, and make you stronger, for in your weakness, my power will come on you, and you're going to be stronger like you've never seen it before. Endure it. Endure it. It's not easy. Verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 12 says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. With a show of hands, just be honest. Whatever you're going through right now is painful. I'm going to put my hands up. It's not nice. I'm not going to invite you to this party because this ain't a party. This is painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those, for those who have been trained by it. So don't abort it. Don't run away from it. Don't give up on it. That training session, as painful as it is, that budget, as tight as it is, that disappointment, as much as it cuts to the heart, it's preparing you for glory. It's preparing you for something greater. It's preparing you for something that will sustain you. You're not on the losing side, church. Sleeping giant, body of Jesus Christ. You are on the winning side. If God is for you, who can be against you? Another moment to say, Amen. Another moment to say, Preach it, Pastor. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised. Do, so, to someone, do not be surprised <laughs> at the painful trial that has come on you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. Why is it as Christians we wake up tomorrow morning, trouble comes on us and we go, ah, no one told me. We need preachers of truth today that are preparing us for the trouble of tomorrow. Not tickling our ears with all the good things and the nice things. And when trouble comes tomorrow, we lose our faith. We've got to prepare people to stand and live with their faith. Where the Bible says when Jesus comes, will he find faith? God help us. This is the kind of preaching that's going to save us in the days that we're living in church. I'm preaching it myself, so... Don't make it personal. Hey, the boss is preaching at me. No, he's preaching at himself. So just help him, Jesus. <laughs> John chapter 16, verse 21. Only the ladies will understand this. And this is your moment, ladies. We respect you. A woman giving birth. John 16, verse 21. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. So please, gentlemen. Man, we made the first mistake. When we said to our wives, when we took her to the hospital, when the water broke, and we said, don't worry, everything's going to be all right. Boop. Bad comment. Don't worry, I have prayed. You will have no pain. Thank you, Jesus. Boop, you liar. Pain is part of the birth. Pain is part of the journey. We've got to be preaching about it. So we don't give up when pain knocks on our door, but we see pain as a gain because we know it's going to take us to another level. God's not going to leave us in our pain. He's going to turn our pain into our gain. And that's not some cliche. It's the truth. He works all things together for the good. The good for those that love Him and be called according to His purposes. All my circumstances. And I'm preaching at you right now. All your circumstances. As sore as it is. As painful as it is. My God and your God is going to turn it around for your good. Amen. For your good. Amen. He's not going to leave you in your pain. He's going to turn it. Amen. Because he can. Because that's his heart. Amen. Amen. A woman giving birth.
to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish. She forgets about the pain because of her joy that a child is born into this world. I want to use that as a cliche. Your baby is coming. It's just that you've been pregnant for so long. And the pain has become so unbearable. And the baby's coming. Turn to someone and say, your baby's coming. This sounds a bit weird, but your baby's coming, bro. Your baby's coming. Jody, come on, Jody. No, don't, Jody. Relax. Not that one. But your baby's coming. <laughs> come on. Good things are coming to the church of Jesus Christ. Come on, church. You are the bride of Christ. Do you think he's an elected bride stand on a street corner forsaken? He will fight the cause with you. But all he's asking you to do is stand with him. Stand with him. Because he'll stand with you. Matthew 4, quickly, verse 1 to 11. I'm almost done. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 4, verse 1 to 11. Here we find a passage of scripture. I'm just going to read verse 1 and 2 first. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit. Everyone say, led by the Spirit. Turn to someone and say, not led by the devil. Mm -mm -mm. Led by the then Jesus led by the Spirit. We were like, oh, I want to be led by the Spirit. Spirit of God, would you just lead me? Do you really want to be led by the Spirit? For some reason, we think the Spirit is going to lead us into all good things. Pleasant atmospheres. Great friendships. <sighs> and so Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. And so the devil came in, verse 3, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do you know, in your weakest moment that the devil tempts you with the greatest pleasure, offers you a way out. You think it's a way out and up, but it's a way out and down. And then suddenly the devil takes Jesus to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple and said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself off this point. For it is written, Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12, and he'll give his angels command concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you won't dash your feet against the stone. That sounded like you went to a church service. The devil even uses the Bible to tempt us. That's why church of Jesus Christ, sleeping giant, you better study this manual. You better get to know this manual more than the devil knows this manual. Because there will be times when the way will seem so right to you because of what's being presented to you. Even with scripture being wrapped around it, that you will think, this must be the Lord saith. It's not the Lord that saith, but it's the devil that dresses himself up as an angel of light, quoting the scriptures. We need to become so rooted and so established and so in the know of what the Bible has to say. Because in these times we're living in, there's so many conspiracy theories that are floating around, devouring people's lives. Amen. And so Jesus said, <laughs> so first he says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. Well, Jesus comes in verse 7 and Jesus answers the devil. Excuse me, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Then suddenly the devil takes Jesus onto a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and all the pleasures and all that can be given to him and says to Jesus, all this I, the devil, will give you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him 
only. Man, we're living in a day and age where Christianity is adopting all these little extras. A little bit of Susan on my right, a little bit of Wendy on my left, a little bit of idolatry here and a little bit of idolatry there. And it's okay, it's just a little bit of a gray area, but it's okay for the grace of God abounds. And we use the grace of God as a license to do whatever we want to do to justify the pleasures of our hearts. God help us. Not comfortable preaching. But we shouldn't have comfortable preaching today. Because we live in a very uncomfortable world. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Do you know that Jesus overcame the temptation by saying it is? And his reference point, all three, were made in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. So I just want to put it out there. All scripture is God breathed. And the whole Bible is useful for rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. We're living in a day and age where people are tearing pages out of the Bible to suit their own itching ears. They're building doctrines on one scripture, on one page, from one book, from one chapter, but they forget about the entire Bible that does not contradict itself. But if you study it, you'll understand it. Amen. So the temptation during your inconvenience, here are the three things I want to say to you quickly. Careful of the following. Number one, taking things into your own hands. If you are the son of God, you seem pretty hungry after 40 days. You know what? If you are, I want to see something supernatural. Take matters into your own hands. Speak to those rocks. Command those rocks. Be bread. Because if you are the son of God, come on, prove yourself. Prove yourself. We're living in a time when people, for some reason, feel that they've got to prove themselves to be recognized, to be accepted. They're in performance mode. Take matters into your own hands. When things get inconvenient, we have a human nature that says, fix it yourself. God, I'm, I'm giving you a break. You know what? You really have so much on your plate every day. So I'm going to do you a deal today. I will fix this. And you take matters into your own hands. You even say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I'll tell you what, take a break. Go on vacation. I'll become the convictor of my husband. I will chirp in his ears. I will convict my wife. I will convict my children. I will become the convictor. Which is only the work of the Holy Spirit. First temptation, when things go rough, is take matters into your own hands. It's the second thing. Second temptation that came to Jesus in the wilderness was throwing in the twelve. Why don't you just throw yourself down from the highest point of the temple? What was he really saying? Come on, just commit suicide. Anybody that would throw themselves from that high temple would fall down dead. And Jesus said, I'm not going to throw in the towel. Because if I throw in the towel, I'm giving up on my father. And I believe in my Father to see me through. I'm not throwing in the towel. The third temptation when you are in a place of inconvenience is the last one. Following quick fix schemes. When the devil said, listen, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and all his pleasures. All you've got to do is buy a ticket, write number, and you've got the lotto. Now, I don't imply that the lotto is evil. I'm just saying, I don't think there's a lot of wisdom in there sometimes. Because I see people using their last 50 bucks. That could be their bread and electricity for another day or so. And they use it and they lose it. Come on now. You've got to hear this. People are behind slot machines putting in their last cent in the hope that something's going to pop out. And then nothing pops out. And if something pops out, it's pure luck. Pure mechanical luck. Don't even thank Jesus afterwards and say, well, it was just Jesus. Unless God intervenes and does something where he will give you the treasures of Egypt in a supernatural way that man can't even understand. Are you with me? When I see people pursuing quick fix schemes, it's like you're being lured by the devil to make things disappear quickly because you're tired of the pain that's in your situation. Amen. Can I also say this to you? Don't use prayer as a moment of God must pull a rabbit out of my hat now. Don't use it as a magic wand. 
Don't use it as a... Do you know, some people will come to the front to be praying. They'll say, no, please, he mustn't pray for me. He mustn't pray for me. The pastor must pray for me. For when he prays for me, things change. I'm not your wand. I'm not your magician. Listen, if God wants to use a donkey to speak to you, you can even use a donkey to pray for you. But at the end of the day, it's your faith in him that moves the hand of God. It's your faith in him that moves the hand of God. Not your faith in a man, but your faith in Jesus. That will move the miraculous in your life. There's way too much superstition, be, superstitious behavior in the church. Grab the moment now. Quickly, Jesus is bypassing you right now. Quickly, jump in the river. Wow, where's Jesus going? As far as I know, he lives in me. Why do we use language that becomes so superstitious? As if God is in the front here, but God's not in the back there. Do you feel God stronger here, or do you feel God stronger back there? Since when is God restricted to a little corner of a building? Superstitious language in the church today needs to be silenced. In me. Is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Godhead, three in one, dwells in me. I am the temple of the living God. Linda, you are the temple of the living God. Tanya, you are the temple of the living God. Father, Hope, Son, and Holy Spirit lives in you, Michelle. You are the temple of the living God. You don't have to go and find Him. You don't have to look for Him. You don't have to go catch the fire anywhere and spend millions to get from this country to that country, from this conference to that conference. We're living in a time where people are looking for the God of the conference. We forget about the God of the universe that lives inside of us. It can be the God in your home. It can be the God in your workplace. It can be the God in your vehicle. It can be God in your life. Why are we chasing, chasing for the fire when the fire is in us? We've just got to learn how to activate it. We've just got to learn how to release it. Instead of following all these superstitious stuff, buy this book, going on a discount, and you put it by your bedside, and your headache will be removed. Really? You just want my money? We've got a really silent stuff that is plaguing the church today. We become a laughing stock. Then a superstitious behavior. Do you know that some pastors will not even talk to people before a service? Because they believe they're going to lose the anointing. Really? You're going to lose the anointing just because you're going to shake another man's hand. Oh, no, no, you should never. You know, some pastors will never shake someone's hand before a church service because something's going to be passed. Listen, devil, you can't enter me. It's a lot of lies and a lot of rubbish and a lot of stuff happening in the church. Got to empty it out. Sleeping giant. Don't just believe everything that's being said left, right, and center. It's time to understand who is in you. I can do all things through Christ. Christ who lives in me. And he's going nowhere. So that old song, reach out and touch the Lord as he passes by. Where's he going? <laughs> Where? Please let me know. Why did he sing that song? And in the same chorus we say, Give God the glory. Give God the glory. Give God the glory for the great things He has done. Then the next verse comes in, Devil, the blood of Jesus is against you. Devil, the blood of Jesus is against you. Next verse, Give God the glory. I'm coming back to you, devil. Don't you go anywhere. Give God the glory. Jesus, I'll come back to you just now. Devil, the blood of Jesus is against you. What are we doing? We sing to the devil, then we sing to God, then we sing to the devil. And the body of Christ, the sleeping giant, just keeps on singing. Keep on singing. Keep on singing. Keep on believing. The power is here, but the power is not there. So when we leave the building, we leave the power behind. Come early for the power. Come late, you, you lose out. Really? I'm not going to end the service, the series. I just think we're going to end the service now because I think God has spoken loud and clear. And the things that I wanted to end off with, how about next Sunday? Is that all right? Shall we just, just squeeze a part three in? Is that all right? Yes. Let's, do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. I want to ask you just to look at me. No, no heads being bowed. No eyes being closed. 
<laughs> when we went off to KZN, um, we took a route that, wow, it took us to a place of so many potholes for about 50 k's. If that wasn't like you're going to miss the pothole, you had to choose which pothole you're going to hit. It was just so bad. But at the end of it, that really frustrating stretch of road, at the end, it took us through this most magnificent Golden Gate experience. For those that have ever been through the Golden Gate, Google it. These amazing mountains. You feel so small and you stand in awe of God's creation. And we say, Father, if we hadn't gone that horrible route, that painful route, that inconvenient route, filled with potholes, I would have never experienced the glory of your splendor. And stand in awe of your presence and to see your goodness shine through. Stop shouting at your potholes because it could lead you to your most glorious moment with Jesus. To a moment of great promotion and favor and blessing. He's not going to leave you in your potholes. He's got something good in mind for you. Doesn't leave you in the valley. He takes you to the mountain top. I was going to tell you something funny and I got emotional, but here, here comes the funny. And as we're driving through the mountain, for the first time I saw the sleeping giant. For all those that have ever been in the bird. Have you ever been told about the sleeping giant? It actually looks like a sleeping giant. This huge head and this huge body. When you look at it, yo, that's the nose, that's the mouth, that's the forehead, the sleeping giant. So we drive, we're looking at the sleeping giant. So I said to my wife, count down, babe. She has no idea what I'm about to do. I say, three, two, one, boom. Oh, you're so funny. <laughs> you're so funny. I try to wake the sleeping giant. Really, can I do that? Maybe I have to do to you tonight what I did to him, a rock structure. Maybe I've got to look at you and me tonight. Maybe we have become that sleeping giant. And maybe tonight I've got to say three, two, one, boom! Wake up! Wake up! It's your time to shine, church. No matter how hard it is, and no matter how difficult it is, or how painful it is, God is not going to leave you, forsake you, or abandon you. But He's going to show His glory through you. Because you are His bride. And He will shine through you. Let's bow our heads together. People that will listen to this message online, may you feel God's presence right now. Wherever you are, sense His presence. He is saying to us as a church tonight, it's time to rise. It's time to stand. It's time to wake up from our slumber. It's not a time to sleep. It's a time to press into Jesus because life is full of the inconvenience. And without Jesus in our life, we will be shipwrecked. We will be abandoned on the side, but with Jesus in our life, He will always see us through. He will never abandon us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. So Church of Jesus Christ, if you are challenged tonight, as much as you are tired, as much as you are confused, as much as you are angry, as much as you are feeling the pain of your trouble, you're saying tonight, oh, I'm not prepared to sit in my pain, but I'm going to stand in my pain and I'm going to trust you to turn it around for me. If that's you, please stand with me right now, church. That's the desire of your heart. The prayer, maybe for some of you, a cry of your heart saying, God, shine through my weakness, shine through my pain, shine through my trouble, shine through my inconvenience, shine through my uncomfortable. Jesus, just before I pray for you, there's someone else who wants to stand. I'm giving you 10 seconds. Your heart is beating. Your heart is beating. You know, you know, this is your moment that could shift your perspective. This is a moment that could change your journey for the better. Just to receive this moment, I'm going to ask you to quickly stand. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone in this building. Firstly, for everyone standing. Because they're obviously in a place where they're going to trust you. In a place where they really desperately need you to shine through. So would you do that tonight? Shine through us as we stand for you. That you will stand for us and that you will walk with us through it all. We will overcome. We will overcome through Jesus and Jesus alone. Thank you for your strength and peace upon each one now in Jesus' name. And for those that are seated, they don't need to feel bad about being seated right now. But around the corner could come a time of inconvenience. Maybe things are okay for now. But maybe there'll be something in a month's time that's going to challenge their faith. So I pray for them as well. For all of us standing or seated. And Father, when the hour of trial comes, we will not sleep. When the hour of trial comes, we will not be silent. When the hour of trial comes, we will not run away. When the hour of trial comes, Father, we will not take matters into our own hands. We will not throw in the towel, Father God. We will not look for quick, rich schemes or quick fix. Schemes. We will look to Jesus as the author and the perfecter of our faith. And we will say, Jesus, we're putting our trust in you. Putting our trust in you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you for your peace right now. Peace, Lord, that surpasses all understanding. To flood our hearts and minds. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us so much that you speak straight at us to get our attention because you care for us, Lord. And you want the best for us. So from this moment, we're going to walk closer with you like never before to hear your heart in every situation. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. And everybody says... You may be seated. Thank you, Lord.